The Secret of the Old Mill, Chapter 20, A Note of Warning Three days later, Fenton Hardy, who had been away from home on a business trip, received a note. No one saw the man who left it at the door. The Hardy boys were at school, and Mrs. Hardy was busy in the kitchen. She heard the front doorbell ringing and went to answer it. But when she opened the door, there was no one in sight. She looked out and saw a man walking briskly down the opposite side of the street. A woman with a baby carriage was strolling past the house. And farther down the street, two men were standing talking on the corner. Somewhat surprised and imagining that her ears must have deceived her, she was about to close the door when she became aware of a white object that fluttered to her feet. It was a cheap envelope, sealed, and with a name of Fenton Hardy written on it in pencil. Mrs. Hardy picked it up, examined it curiously, and then brought it into the house and placed it on the table in her husband's study. It was not an unusual occurrence to have letters left at the door in this manner, as occasionally anonymous letters were left for the detective giving him hints or advice concerning cases on which he was engaged. To most of these, he paid no attention, although sometimes valuable information was brought to his notice in this manner. This, Mrs. Hardy judged, was another such communication, which was why the person who delivered it had been careful to hurry away after ringing the bell. Mr. Hardy did not return home until late that afternoon. He had been over to Barmont Village, where the federal authorities were closely watching two men thought to have been in leagues with the counterfeiters. Mr. Hardy had followed one man to a nearby city and seen the fellow pass a small package to a woman in black, who had quickly disappeared in a crowd. But the noted detective knew the woman and knew where she could be located when wanted. The boys had arrived back from school, had left their books at the house, and had set out with Chet Morton for a cruise in the motorboat. When Mr. Hardy came back, he glanced over his mail and was settling down to read the evening paper when his wife remembered the note that had been left at the door that afternoon. Someone left a letter for you this afternoon, she said. I heard the doorbell ring, but when I went to answer it, there was no one at the door. I picked up the letter, and I put it on your study table. Fenton Hardy went into the study and picked up the letter, slitting open the envelope. Within was a thin sheet of cheap paper on which had been written a few lines in pencil. He read the message with a slow smile, and then handed the paper over to his wife. Someone's trying to scare me, he said. She picked up the note in a crude, ill-formed hand, she read the following, Better give up this counterfeit case, or we'll take the shirt off your back. We know this game too well. Let this be a warning to you. Poor Bloom is a rank outsider. Better let him go. Mrs. Hardy looked up anxiously. What are you going to do about this note? She asked. The detective shrugged. Ignore it, of course. But they may harm you. They may try. They won't be the first ones to have tried to frighten me away from a case. But they must be right in Bayport to deliver a note like this. I've suspected all along that their headquarters were here. Don't worry, Laura. I'm not afraid of them. But I do worry. They're desperate men, and they'll stop at nothing. Fenton Hardy laughed. It isn't the first time I've been threatened. It's only a bluff. I'll stay right on the case although so far I haven't been able to make much progress on it. But this matter of the note is adding insult to injury, don't you think? First of all, they send one of their men around here to fool us to the extent of $800 with their counterfeit money, and now they try to frighten me away from handling the case any further. Fenton Hardy looked at the note again, and then replaced it carefully in the envelope. You didn't see anyone on the street after the doorbell rang, he asked. Oh, there were a few. There were about three or four people walking by, but I didn't notice any of them particularly. They all seemed quite average people. None of them looked at all suspicious. The chap that delivered the note was probably hiding around the corner of the house until you went inside again. That's their usual scheme. It wouldn't have done much good if you had seen him. Probably some chap they picked up on the street and bribed to slip the note in the door. I don't like it. 
At that moment, Frank and Joe came into the house, flushed from their outing on the bay. They were laughing at the recollection of some remarkable acrobatic feat that Chet Morton had attempted on the bow of the motorboat, the result of which had been the sudden immersion of Chet in the chilly waters of the bay. He had just left them, his clothing dripping wet, heading for home on his motorcycle, vowing that he could have stood on his hands on the bow of the boat if only Frank hadn't steered to the left when he should have steered to the right. However, he had said cheerfully, I missed my bath last Saturday night anyway, so this will make up for it. The Hardy boys recounted their adventures, and after Fenton Hardy had chuckled over the plight of Chet, he tossed over the mysterious letter to them. What do you think of that? he asked the boys. Frank and Joe read the scrawled warning with interest. Trying to frighten you away from the case, are they? said Frank, as he gave back the note. Looks like it. You won't pay any attention to it, of course. Not a bit. Although your mother seems to think I'll be carried home on a stretcher any day now. When did the note come? Joe inquired with deep interest. Mrs. Hardy told them how the strange letter had been delivered, and when they learned that it had been left at the door instead of being sent through the post office, both boys became immediately excited. They did not, however, air their suspicions at the time, and it was not until they were alone after supper that they discussed the topic between them. That settles it, declared Frank, with finality. The counterfeiters must be right here in Bayport. Or nearby. That's what I mean. If they were out of town, the letter would have been sent by mail. It's getting to be a little too much. As Dad said, it was adding insult to injury, tricking Mon to the extent of $800, and now sending an impudent note like that. It's up to us to use what we know. You mean to see if we can find out anything more about the mill? I mean to find out something there is to be found out about it. I'm with you. When do we want to start? When should we? Tonight. So soon? Why not? It's all right with me. If we're going to go back here at all, we may as well get it over with as soon as we can, said Frank. I've been thinking over a way to get away with it, and I think we should be able to get inside that pl that place and investigate it without much trouble. How? Do you remember how Carl Stumner remarked that you look something like Lester? Yeah. And there's a bit of a resemblance, too. If you're about the same build and you both have fair, curly hair, I think you should be able to impersonate him if we went around there at night and at a distance and at night time they might mistake you for him, even if we were discovered. I never thought of that, Joe admitted. It isn't a bad idea. I'm willing to try it. It will be risky, of course, but I'm practically convinced that the old mill is where this counterfeit money is coming from. The only way we'll ever find out is to go through it ourselves. If we told the town police what we suspected, they would only laugh at us, and probably they'd be so clumsy about taking any action that the counterfeiters would get wind of it. The only way is to keep it to ourselves and go out there quietly and see what we can find. How can we get out tonight? Mother won't let us go. She'll be afraid we'll get hurt. I hate to do anything underhanded, but it's our only chance. We'll go out for a motorcycle trip this evening. And as soon as it gets dark, we'll head for the mill. We should reach there about 10 o'clock. We'll park the bikes a good distance away from the mill so they won't hear us coming. And then we'll walk the rest of the way. If we get the goods on the counterfeiters, we'll be heroes. If we don't, we'll catch a lecture for sure. We'll just have to take our chances on that. But How we get to the mill? asked Joe. We'll have to wait until we get there before we lay our plans. I've sort of forgotten the layout of the place, but if we work it right, I think we should be able to get inside. I'd like to get into the mysterious stone room that Lester mentioned and see what sort of machinery they have in there. I'll bet it's an engraving plant and a printing press instead of a patent breakfast food machine. What if we're caught? That's a chance we're taking. I've got to risk it. What if we find that place is really the headquarters of the counterfeit gang? 
Look at it that way. So for the rest of the evening, the boys were conspiriously studious. They were occupied with their books until twilight fell, after which Frank yawned and murmured that he would like a breath of fresh air. I think I'll go out for a little spin on the motorcycle, he said casually. I'll go with you, observed Joe promptly. Benton Hardy looked up. Yes, you've been in the house all evening. Go ahead. Don't be long, advised Mrs. Hardy. We won't be any longer than we can help, said Frank mysteriously. With that, the Hardy boys left the house and went out to the garage for the motorcycles. They drove around the streets of Bayport for some time until at last it grew darker, and then they headed their machines out towards the shore road. The moon was just rising over the bay when they left the city, and they drove at good speed into the country. Now to tackle the old mill, said Frank. Chapter 21 At the Mill The two boys made good time out into the country, and when at last they reached the abandoned road that led down to Willow River, it was not quite ten o'clock. As they rode, they discussed their plan of action, and it was agreed that they should leave the motorcycles beside the road at the same place they had left them on the occasion of their previous visit to the mill. "'I'd like to have them closer to the river,' said Frank, "'for we might have to clear out of here in a hurry.' but we can't afford to let them hear us coming. And it's a calm night. They could hear a motorcycle for half a mile, opined his brother. They left the machines in the shade of some trees by the roadside and went to the rest of the way on foot. They could see clearly, for the moon had risen high and the gray ribbon of road extended before them. I wish it had been a bit darker, Joe said. We'll have to be careful when we get near the place. They may have someone posted on guard. Oh, well, we can look the place over when we get there. At last, they emerged on the hilltop that overlooked Willow River. Below them lay the stream, with water shining in the moonlight. The deep banks of the willow trees along the border cast heavy shadows, and a light mist overhung the fields and hedges in the distance. Gloomy and mysterious, the heavy bulk of the old mill rose from beside the river, near the shimmering silver streak of mill. Not a light shone from the building, and it appeared absolutely deserted. Perhaps they've all moved away, suggested Joe. I noticed that the buildings were all boarded up when we were here last time. They haven't moved away. Never fear. Cautiously, the boys went down the slope, they left the road and kept to the shadows of the trees, skirting the open space of meadows that lay between the grove and the mill itself. They did not speak for that night, it was so calm and clear that sound carried for a considerable distance. They could hear the dull roar of the rapids and the waterfall, sounding hollow and lonely in the moonlight. They came to the edge of the grove and moved slowly about in the deep shadows, the grass sinking beneath their feet. When they had reached a point about two hundred feet from the mill, they paused to reconnoiter. We've got across that open space, whispered Frank. And what then? See that willow tree beside the mill? Joe nodded. It reaches right to the roof. It looks to be our best bet. If we can climb that tree and drop to the roof, or get in a window, we'll be all right. As long as we can get up the tree without being heard. We have to take our chances on that, Frank said in a low voice. I think it's going to be harder to cross that open space. For two hundred feet, the grassy sward was bathed in moonlight, and they could not walk across it without being in full view of anyone who might be watching from the mill. But it had to be crossed, as the mill itself was isolated on the bank of the river, and on this side there was no protecting shade to enable them to creep up closer. We'll have to crawl across the grass, Joe whispered. Ready? I'm ready. Go easy and quiet. If you hear a sound, don't move. They dropped to their knees, and they left the shadows of the wood. They began to crawl slowly on hands and knees towards the willow tree at the right of the mill. Inch by inch, they made their way forward. The moon was high in the sky and seemed like a giant searchlight. 
It seemed impossible that they could cross that open space without being discovered. Every blade of grass seemed clearly revealed by the moonlight. When they were about halfway towards the mill, they heard a sound in the distance. It was the banging of a heavy door. There was a warning whisper from Frank. They lay motionless in the thick grass. For a moment the deep silence prevailed. Then, from the mill, they heard a voice. I saw someone out on the hillside. They were startled, but still they did not move. Their only hope of safety lay in silence and in remaining motionless. You're crazy, Markle, replied someone. There's no one out there. I tell you, I saw someone crawling down through the grass. I'm sure of it. I saw him from the upper window. Whereabouts? Out there, see? You can see something dark up there. There was silence for a moment or so, and then the second man laughed. It's only a log. I tell you, it isn't a log. A log doesn't move. That isn't moving. It was. Well, if you're so sure of it, why don't you go up and see for yourself? You're getting so nervous lately that you think people are hanging around here all the time. I've got a right to be nervous. We're not safe here, I tell you. We should have moved out of here weeks ago. We'll never find a place as safe as this. Is that so? Ever since those two boys came snooping round here and asking Lester questions, I've been suspicious. They've got their eye on this place, let me tell you. They were down at the railway station the other day, and when I slipped the package to Burgess, I'm mighty sure they saw me. Just a couple of kids. You're too nervous. Well, I'm going up on the hill and take a look at that log, as you call it. As it happened... There was a log lying in the grass close to Frank, but he realized that if Markle came up to investigate, he would have no chance to evade discovery. They could not get up and run away, at least not until capture seemed inevitable. Frank's heart sank. They had been discovered before they had a chance even to reach the mill. At that moment, relief came from a most unexpected quarter, a dark cloud that had been creeping across the sky began to obscure the moon, and gradually the vivid illumination that bathed the hillside gave way to gloom and darkness. The cloud hid the moon completely. "'Now's our chance,' whispered Frank to his brother. "'Head towards the willow tree.' He scrambled to his feet, and together the boys raced down the slope towards the willow tree back of the mill. Their feet made no sound in the deep grass." They were taking a desperate chance they knew, for in spite of the cloud that had fallen across the moon, Markle might be able to see them. But Markle had just emerged from the mill, and his eyes were not yet accustomed to the gloom. As the boys reached the shelter of the willow tree, the moon emerged from behind the cloud, and slowly the hillside was again bathed in radiance. Panting, the boys halted beneath the tree and looked back. They could see the dark figure of Markle as he cut across the slope in a diagonal direction, and they watched as he drew near the place where they had been lying. They saw him stop, kick at something in the grass, and then they heard him mutter as he turned away. "'Well, what was it?' called the other man from the doorway of the mill. "'It was a log, all right,' admitted Markle in a disgruntled tone. But I could have sworn I saw it move a while ago. Better get your eyes tested. To this pleasantry, Markle made no reply, but trudged on down the slope until he again reached the mill. The boys pressed close to the willow tree. You may think I've been too careful, they heard Markle say, but we've got good reason to be careful. You know what'll happen to the whole crowd of us if we're caught. Sure, about twenty years in the pen. But we're not going to get caught, I tell you. Don't be too sure. We can't afford to take chances anyway. I'd rather keep my eyes open and get fooled by a few logs on the hillside than feel too safe and spend the rest of my life behind bars. I guess you're right. Anyway, everything is all right tonight. I'm going to take a trip round the mill anyway. Your nerves must be jumpy. 
They are, snapped Markle. My nerves are always jumpy when I think I see something moving down towards here from the woods, and I don't care whether that was a log or not. I saw something move. Oh, probably a sheep or a cow that strayed on from some other farm, or even a dog. Well, it might have been a dog, Markle admitted. We'd better get to work. Doc is waiting for us. I'm going to walk around the mill once more anyway. Go ahead, go ahead then, said the other man. I'll be inside with Doc. The boys heard heavy footsteps as Markle left the doorway, and they saw him his dark figure in the moonlight as he came round the side of the mill. They pressed closer against the willow tree and lowered their heads so that their faces would not be seen. Both were wearing dark clothes and dark caps. They did not look up, for they knew that their faces would be gray against the surrounding darkness and that Markle might see them. In an agony of suspense, they heard the footsteps come closer. Markle poked around among the rubbish at the side of the hill. It was plain that he was not yet convinced that he had been suffering from a delusion when he saw the moving form on the hillside, and he meant to satisfy himself beyond any shadow of a doubt that there was no one lurking in the vicinity of the mill. Nearer and nearer he came, his body brushed against the overhanging branches of the willow. He was now only a few yards away from the hardy boys. Breathlessly they waited. They stood, rigid but motionless, not daring to look up. Markle's footsteps came to a stop. He was standing but a short distance away, listening intently. Had he seen them? 